Please subscribe, like and share our videos. Exclusive content brought to you here on Latif Yahya's channel only. Latif Yahya has asserted his rights under the Copyright, Designs, and Patents Act, 1988 to be identified as the author of this work. This book is sold subject to the condition that it shall not, by way of trade or otherwise, be left, resold, hired out, or otherwise circulated without the author's prior consent in any form of binding or cover other than that in which it is published and without a similar condition including this condition being imposed on the subsequent purchaser. Chapter 8. Excesses. It's the 18th of June 1988, a Monday. Late morning, Uday phones and tells me I'll be picked up in the evening. He orders me to shave off my beard but leave my mustache and I'm to wear a bodyguard's uniform. Although Kurt, his voice sounds quite friendly. Our sporting difference of opinion is forgotten and Uday has given me my new apartment. It's comfortable and I'm glad to be out of project number 7 despite all its luxuries. I still have staff to wait on me here but don't have Ude as a housemate. Four days previously, on June 14th, it was my 24th birthday. I didn't celebrate it in any way. What was there to celebrate? Latif Yahia no longer existed. Anyway, I was alone in the flat. I strode around it wondering if my parents had given up all hope of seeing their eldest son again. I hoped they were coping with their loss but knew they would be particularly sad that day. My birthday had always been a special day of celebration. For my 24th birthday they would have arranged a great party. I imagined what they would have done, hired a hotel room in one of Baghdad's best hotels, booked music, singers and dancing girls. Invited all my relations and family friends. It would have been a day to remember. Instead of which it was a sad day to forget. For both my parents and me. To make matters worse, my birthday happened to fall on a Thursday and that's a special day in Iraq. Thursdays are our equivalent of Saturdays in the West. On Thursdays, most hotels and bars stay open all night as Friday is a day off, the Islamic Sunday. It would have been great to see all my friends again. I wondered if they ever thought of me? I drowned myself pity in whiskey which freed my thoughts. Of course they were thinking of me. I'd chosen my friends carefully. They'd have been phoning my parents hoping for good news. And praying I was still alive even if deep down they knew that was highly unlikely after all these months. Today, four days later, it's Uday's 24th birthday. I know there's no chance of him spending his special day all alone but wasn't sure if he'd invite me to his celebrations. But it seems he has. At least I think he has. He didn't say anything about his birthday on the phone so I didn't like to either. He didn't even say I would be taken to project number 7 but I can guess. No, I'm not just guessing I know. I know Uday by now. I know he has the biggest ego on the planet and preparations for his birthday have been going on for over a week. According to bodyguards, Uday's master of ceremonies, Namir al Tikriti has been fussing around preparing the project number 7 party room. He's even enlisted Halal al-Aki, a relation of Uday, to help. Al-Aki has been arriving with decorations and yet more decorations. Champagne has been delivered by the case. The bodyguards have also been tasting special party dishes prepared by the project number 7 chef. Unlike myself, Uday has the perfect opportunity to put on a lavish 24th birthday celebration for his friends. Years ago, he made his birthday a public holiday in Iraq and, for almost an equal number of years, his birthday parties have been the most talked about social soirees in Baghdad. Mainly because they involved excesses that weren't hidden from the public as the parties were held in one of the hotel nightclubs. It wasn't just his birthday parties that were sliding into depravity, his whole life was becoming one long excess. A ceaseless extravagance in a quest to satisfy his inner demonic self, made possible by the greatest financial backing any young man bubbling with testosterone could possibly have. Uday has everything, money, power, influence and he knows and abuses it. His world is one of decadence, recklessness and sin. He has no sexual ethics or moral compass, 
his quest is just the pursuit of pleasure. If Uday oversteps the mark, his bodyguards cover it up. If his crimes can no longer be concealed, he's protected by the iron fist of his father or the influence of his doting mother. In my cell and new apartment, I've thought time and time again about why he's become the dysfunctional son. Why he wants to snort his life away as if it's a hedonistic drug. How he can possibly be so unaware that his own excess of freedom is destroying him and those who come into contact with him? He was a dead loss at school and fully aware of it but brazened his way through with intimidation. He knew his teachers were unimpressed and only gave him top marks because they were too afraid not to as he was their president's son. It worked and served to encourage Uday in later life. So in a way he learned a valuable lesson at school. Or maybe he learned from his father? All children idolize their parents. But Uday positively glorified his father and acted exactly as his father did by ordering around his subordinates and professors. He turned up when it suited him and went home whenever he wanted to. He brought his girlfriends into lessons, his bodyguard wrote copied lessons from the blackboard for him and private tutors did his homework. Just like his rebellious father, Uday's one aim was to prove he was more powerful than his teachers and get away with such behavior. And he certainly got top grades for that. At just 14 years old, he drove a Porsche to school. At 15, he had his first employee who sourced girls for him. At 16, he fired his Kalashnikov into the ceiling at Baghdad's exclusive Al Alwiya club to great applause. Whatever he did, people still praised him, including a certain world leader. No wonder Uday is how he is. I carefully shave off my perfectly clipped beard, leaving my mustache. I look at myself in the mirror. I smile falsely at myself. I don't think I'll ever get used to those protruding teeth. They're comfortable and don't bother me at all except when I see my reflection. I realize I'm distracting myself from shaving. But, try as I might, I can't help thinking about Uday's ferocious devotion to an immoral life, his addiction to hedonism. He's not really changed his lifestyle for years. Every day, at around 2 p.m. after lunch, which he always has at Project No. 7 or one of the Baghdad hotels, he goes with his personal guards on their daily grand tour. Their convoy of luxury cars cruises around all the coffee houses in Baghdad. After that, they move on to the girls' schools and then the universities. Uday drives up and down like a police patrolman but in a Lamborghini, Ferrari, Maserati or Porsche. When he sees a girl he fancies he beeps his horn, drives up onto the pavement and follows the girl until she agrees to talk to him. If she ignores him or refuses, he sends one of his bodyguards to talk to her. If that fails, she's simply abducted. He seems to need sex practically every afternoon. Sometimes the bodyguards bring three or four girls to him at the same time. Either he chooses one, goes to bed with her and has the others thrown out or he keeps them all and forces them to have group sex. Another vice is Uday starts drinking early in the evening. Beer, cognac and whiskey are his favorite tipples. Uday doesn't just pour alcohol into himself, he drinks for the sheer enjoyment of it. There's hardly a single night he goes to bed sober. Before going out, he has numerous phone calls with different girls. After lining up his date, or dates, he spends ages deciding what to wear. He usually finally agrees on what his personal dresser, Yasim, chooses for him. But, before arriving at that momentous decision, there are always fierce debates between the two of them. Choosing Uday's accessories requires a similar length of time and equally serious reflection. Uday has well over a hundred wristwatches and countless rings and gold chains. The contents of his jewelry safe would make the custodians of Fort Knox jealous. The odd thing is that although Uday has everything anyone else could possibly wish for, he always wants what someone else has. If someone is more fashionably dressed than he is, he'll have them discreetly removed by his bodyguards. If he spots someone has a more exclusive Rolex, Uday wants it. There and then. If he sees a driver in a better sports car, Uday totally loses control of himself. That's why in Baghdad's exclusive clubs of Al Daraj, Al said, Al Sarek and Al Alwiya all the affluent members are careful to avoid having an altercation with Uday. Anyone unfortunate enough not to be able to avoid him had better behave subserviently. 
The situation is similar in Baghdad's top hotels. There's no hotel porter, no bar or nightclub manager that Uday doesn't know or, more to the point, doesn't know Uday. When Uday's hordes arrive like a shoal of starving piranhas, all training and corporate rules are forgotten. Uday usually makes a grand entrance followed by between 8 to 10 women. All of these young beauties have been instructed to follow in his footsteps and not to do anything, apart from look stunning, without Uday ordering them to. His favorite haunts are the Babel Obri, the Al Rashid and the Meridian Hotels. When Uday's entourage walks into foyers, restaurants, bars or nightclubs, everyone present is expected to respectfully stand up and greet him. If other men dare to dance when Uday is on the dance floor, he takes this as an insult. The offender has his dance routine rudely interrupted as he suffers the indignation of being forcibly removed by Uday's bodyguards who act as presidential bouncers. But the offender's humiliation doesn't end there. He'll probably be beaten up and, in the worst case scenario, if he's a really good dancer or has stepped on Uday's toe, he'll be thrown into the nearest prison. Uday wants, or demands, the dance floor for himself and his girls. The usual custom is to send the girls to dance first. That's when they can attract unwelcome attention. When such foolhardy alpha males are disposed of and relegated way down the Greek alphabet, Uday sits watching his girls with the critical eye of a beauty pageant judge but without their restrained lust. He'll shout vulgarities at the girls encouraging them to be more erotic. If he's in a good mood, he'll take out his gun and shoot into the ceiling, the chandelier or the walls in rhythm to the music. If he's in a bad mood, he'll shoot at the staff. Particularly if they're Egyptian. There are thousands of Egyptian waiters and servants in Baghdad earning a menial living but Uday hates them. He considers them a plague of locusts feeding on Iraq's wealth. These binge drinking, womanizing tours in public make Uday feel big, strong and powerful. It's as if he constantly has to prove himself. But who to? Maybe to his father who is worshipped like a god who has built himself no less than 83 palaces throughout Iraq and has every world leader racking his conscience on whether it is prudent to befriend him. Like the best psychoanalyst in the USA, I understand it must drive Uday crazy to see a picture, a statue, a heroic depiction of his revered father on every street corner as he roars along in his Ferrari. If Uday switches on the television, he sees his father on the screen and the speakers assault his eardrums with, Saddam, our president, our supreme commander, the leader of the National Command, the hero of Cadassia, the knight of the Arab nation. Alferis al Maywar, the bold knight. Saddam, the direct descendant of the Prophet. Saddam, the noble fighter, son of a family to which the Imam al Hussein, his ancestor and the son of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib belonged. Even I had to agree it's a tough act to follow. Uday is the first son of Saddam. He was born into a world so turbulent and unreal that as a child he could barely understand the carnage that was going on around him. School was his first chance to prove himself, his university studies were an insult to his power. He charged his way through structured phases of his life that other adolescents allow to mold them into model citizens. Rather than have his character shaped, he followed the example of his father and rebelled and was rewarded at university by completing his studies in record time despite the fact he hadn't sat a single exam. One thing he did learn is that being Uday, and imitating his father, pays. His problem is how to outdo his father. I can still remember the day when all the distinguished professors in Baghdad were summoned to a ceremony in the auditorium maximum. No students were invited for fear of a protest. At only 23, Uday was appointed rector of the country's main university. This honor was to thank him for financing the construction of the Saddam Technical University. Of course, the money hadn't really come from Uday's personal fortune. The Iraqi people had paid for it from the profits of our oil. But the official line was Mr. Uday Saddam Hussein had made the millions available. He wasn't just appointed an honorary director of the Saddam Technical University. One of the university professors, Mazen Abd al-Hamid, proposed that Uday should also be elected rector of the whole university. His suggestion was accepted without a single opposing vote. So arguably the university's worst student ever, who could barely string a sentence together, became head of the university. Ordinary, 
hardworking students regarded Uday's appointment as a slap in the face. Probably most of the professors did as well but none had the courage to complain. One word of dissent and they would have been removed from the university in an instant and perhaps even killed. Any criticism of the president's family is a serious offense, even if it's true. No less an absurd appointment was Uday's role as president of the National Olympic Association. To this day, he has no idea how many players there are in a football team, what disciplines the decathlon consists of or even how often the Olympic Games are held. While I dry myself and am running this time-lapse version of Uday's life story through my mind, I go into the sitting room and make myself a drink. By now, it's shortly afternoon but I'm not hungry. I sit on the comfortable sofa and begin making my first brief notes about Uday. I try to remember conversations and other details, friends I know from university, people I've met during my training. Munyam Hamd, I think to myself, is a man you can trust. He's the only officer who can see through all this crap and whose behavior is half normal. He might be forced to join in Uday's nonsense but it pains him to do so and makes him sympathetic. However, I don't start with Munham but with Abbas al Janabi. I write, head of Uday's newspapers. I chuckle as I write Abbas al Janabi's name down. He's a great softy. I was introduced to him at the Olympic Club. As I said previously, he was appointed to his role after Uday raped his niece last spring. The newspapers Babel and Al Rashid were placed under Uday's control because his father knew it was important to control the media and Uday suddenly decided that he was a great writer. In a grand ceremony, he was duly appointed chairman of both newspapers. In one of the first editorials after that, which I'm sure Uday didn't write himself although it bore his name, he even compared himself with the respected author Al Jawahiri. It was quite laughable as the style of writing wasn't at all similar. In an attempt to raise the intellectual level of the Iraqi population, Uday published a literary work by his grandfather, Kerala Tulfa. The title of this but this propaganda is three things that God should not have created, Persians, Jews and horseflies. Kerala Tulfa is an important person in the lives of the Hussein family. The cog around which everything revolves. He's had great influence on them all, Saddam as well as Uday. I take a new sheet of paper. At the top of it, I write the name of Kerala Tulfa. Then I ponder, who is this man who hated Persians, Jews and horseflies like the plague? I remember. Kerala Tulfa comes from Tikrit. He was an army officer who took part in the uprising against Hashemite King Faisal II way back in 1941. After leaving the army, he supported his clan with a mixture of street robbery and fraud. So this much respected Hussein family ancestor was once a common thief. I jot this career progression down. Kerala, first a rebellious army officer then a street thief. Then comes the next step in the Hussein family tree. Saddam Hussein's real father died before he was born. After her son came into the world, his mother married Ibrahim al-Hassan who refused to have anything to do with the boy so Saddam was passed on to his uncle, the very same Kerala Tulfa. I write, Saddam passed to Kerala Tulfa. I suddenly remember some details about his family that Uday boasted about at school. But I put them aside so as not to lose my thread and go on spinning out my thoughts. Kerala had a son of his own, Adnan Kerala. He was the only friend Saddam ever had in Tikrit. When Kerala left his homeland in 1955 to move to Baghdad, he took Saddam, Adnan and his daughters with him. Sajida is the eldest daughter. In accordance with Muslim rights, Saddam and Sajida were betrothed when just children. I add to my notes, Saddam's future wife Sajida is his uncle Kerala's daughter. I continue the Hussein family history. The Tulfa family builds up wealth and power in Baghdad. In 1963, when the Ba'ath party seizes power, Saddam marries Sajida Tulfa, his cousin. A year later in 1964, his first son, Uday, is born. Saddam has little time to care for his son. The political struggle takes priority. In 1966, he has a second son, Kusay. I lean back and reflect on what I know about the relationship between the two sons. Even at school, 
Uday used to make jokes about his younger brother. It was jealously. Kuse was his father's favorite son, mollycoddled and protected from the world. Unlike Uday, Kuse never caused any scandals during his time at school. He was the quieter one, the more balanced and rational. Maybe that's why Saddam preferred him and gave him more attention. Uday spent a lot of his early childhood with his grandfather Kerala. So history repeated itself and he too was passed on to Uncle Kerala just as his father had been into Crete. Uday had a close relationship with his grandfather who had a great influence of him. At school, Uday once shouted, My grandfather taught my father to kill any enemy who came his way. I remember him also saying chillingly, Just wait until I become president. I'll be crueler than my father. You will often remember these words and yearn for the days of Saddam Hussein. His promise depresses me. After all, I'm Uday's Fadai, his serf. It's my duty to ensure he lives to make Iraq an even more oppressive place. I stand up and pace around, stopping in front of the mirror that hangs on the wall by the sofa. I see Latif Yahya, who has ceased to be Latif Yahya for 10 months, and is now Uday Saddam Hussein. The double of the most hated man in Iraq. If Uday ever does become president my fate would definitely be sealed. How much more would Iraqis hate him if he's in charge of the whole country? But Iraqis have no say in the matter. It's already been decided and the clan dominate everything in the country anyway. After Saddam Hussein becomes president in 1979, Adnan Kerala became defense minister and Uncle Tulfa was appointed governor of Baghdad. How ironic! him becoming governor of the city whose population he used to rob. Saddam gathered all his friends round him to enjoy their moment of glory. On the piece of paper, I write, Saddam President, Adnan Minister, Uncle Kerala Governor of Baghdad. I find I'm sweating. Has the fan stopped working? No, it's my thoughts that are getting me hot under the collar. I sip my drink, leave my notes and thoughts for a minute and go into the bathroom. Two, three times I splash cold water on my face. It feels good and calms me down. In the unfortunate situation I find myself in, I need to keep a cool head. Where does Uday's madness come from? Why is he the way he is? Uday certainly hasn't changed much since his school days. Even back then, the most important things in his life were women and cars. And in order to assert himself, he needed to dominate and humiliate all those around him. It's no surprise when you consider what his grandfather was like. The same man taught Saddam that violence pays whether in the street as a thief or in a palace as president. But Saddam has found a safety valve in Baghdad's high society. When Uday was 13, he was always praising his grandfather. How he was unyielding in his fight against the British, how he built up and ran the Tikriti Mafia clan in Baghdad. The ruthless, violent methods he used to increase his power even though he started off nothing more than a minor street thief in Baghdad. The street thief of Baghdad, he became a myth, a symbol, a role model, a spiritual father to Uday just as he'd been Saddam's mentor in violence. He taught them both the law and murder. The dedicated application of this teaching had brought Saddam to the pinnacle of power in Iraq. Uday knew that. It had been effectively drilled into him. But Uday could never turn that knowledge into daring deeds. His family already had power. And how could Uday possibly be better than his father, the president, the god, the direct descendant of the prophet? If Uday misbehaved as a child, his father beat him with an iron rod. If he was afraid, Saddam made him watch videos of torture and executions. Saddam was passionate about these videos that showed the painful end of his enemies. Uday didn't dare disobey and refused to watch them because cruelty is not considered a despicable character flaw by Saddam but something positive. When it all became too much for Uday, he fled to his grandfather. He understands me, he listens to me, he's interested in me, Uday had told us repeatedly at school. It's now gone 3pm and I've got two hours before I'm due at project number 7. I use the time to go through my notes, point by point, when something else occurs to me. At school, Uday was always praising his mother. To hear him talk, you'd think she was a living goddess, a fairy tale being, an ivory statue. 
Uday's mother never made public appearances by Saddam's side. She had to stay in the background and fulfill her duties as a wife and mother. In Baghdad, it was an open secret that Saddam was always having affairs. His women were smuggled into the palace by Kamal Hanna who, apart from procurer of presidential mistresses, was also Saddam's close friend and food taster. For many years Saddam succeeded in keeping his illicit liaison secret. But when he had an affair with the tennis player Najida, everything became public knowledge. Najida was married to the Minister of Culture and Media, Hamd Yusuf Hamidi. It was even rumored that Saddam had planned to leave his family to be with her. I was under no illusion that Uday hated Kamal Hanna with a vengeance. He brings women to my father and it's destroying my mother, he would wail as he lay drunk on a lounger by the swimming pool at 3 a.m. in the morning. He revealed that his grandfather Kerala also wanted to kill the food taster. No doubt for the anguish he'd caused to his eldest daughter. Neither seemed to blame Saddam. I spend a long time wondering who'll be invited to Uday's party. His father and mother definitely won't be there. Neither will his brother. I'm sure of that. The presence of the family outside of the main palace would present too great a security risk. Also, I'm sure Uday's had a birthday dinner with his whole family over the past few days. Not very many politicians will be there either. Uday has such a bad reputation that most members of Baghdad society try to avoid the president's son and have done for years. They're fully aware how unpredictable and volatile he is and try their best not to find themselves in an embarrassing situation that could have dire consequences. One thing really puzzles me. It would be madness for Uday to invite me, his double. But then Uday is mad. I wonder if he's so egotistical he doesn't care if people find out he has a fide. It's no secret in Iraq that members of the president's family have fides. But ordinary Iraqis who are deceived by the doubles never have the chance to study small details. Most public appearances are such spectacles that the crowd concentrate more on the event itself rather than on one individual. A party is different. On the other hand, most of Uday's close personal friends have already met me at project number 7. Their lives all depend on the same vow of secrecy as the rest of us. Anyone who reveals anything they shouldn't is dead and they know it. I'm collected by bodyguards at 8 p.m. and taken to Uday's residence. His master of ceremonies has certainly been working overtime. There are extravagant floral displays all over the place. A small stage with a sound and lighting system has been set up by the swimming pool. The party room on the first floor has been filled with sparkly glitter. The staff have increased in number and all are wearing brilliant white. Freshly starched uniforms with shiny gold buttons and the obligatory white gloves. The birthday boy only gives me a cursory greeting. Enjoy yourself, he says in passing. I take his detached manner to mean that he'd like me to stay in the background and not talk to anyone which suits me fine. The guests begin to arrive, Daffer Aref, the director of the Olympic Club. Daffer is a sycophant of Uday's and is married to the actress Hanan Abdulatif. When he was a student, Uday would often have Anand picked up by his bodyguards and brought to one of his farms outside Baghdad. She couldn't stand Uday but was forced to give in to his demands because she knew she had no other choice if she wanted to avoid the fate of student Nala Sabe. That poor girl refused Uday but was still raped and then thrown to his starving Dobermans and Rottweilers. Hanan Abdelatif greets Uday politely but he doesn't even glance at her. Hanan doesn't seem at all worried at being snubbed and turns to talk to Abdelakal. He's a short, small man with crooked shoulders and a limp handshake. But Abdelakal is a huge star in Iraq. He's one of Uday's favorite singers and has recorded countless records. He's always played on the radio, regularly appears on television and is invited to sing at all Uday's parties. Abdel's band is warming up playing pleasant instrumental background music. He sits down at a table with Hanan and her husband. I can't hear what they're talking about but they're soon deep in conversation and burst out laughing a few times. The next guest to arrive is Mohammed Al-Bodadi, a friend of Uday's with an almost equal reputation to the president's son for skirt chasing. As proof of their friendship and shared hobby, he once gave Uday the gift of his own sister. With him is Darid Ganawi, a car dealer. Uday's passion for cars has made him rich. I've never counted them but Uday must own over a hundred cars, 
Maseratis, Ferraris, Porsches, Jaguars, Mercedes in every possible model specification and shade of color. Cars are like guns to Uday. Objects of devotion, fashion accessories and mobile status symbols that reinforce his confidence and make him someone special for all to see. To make sure he's the only person in Iraq who drives a Ferrari, Uday has even introduced a law banning their importation. All Uday's cars are housed in two underground garages beside the Al Hayat block within the palace grounds. During my driving training, I was there many times but even today I still can't believe what I saw. Dozens of mechanics are employed to look after Uday's fleet and keep it in showroom condition. Mercedes is parked next to Mercedes in different colors but each with the latest specs such as anti-lock brakes and powerful sound systems that make you feel like you're sitting in a nightclub. The limousines have built-in cocktail cabinets made of polished walnut, televisions and telephones. There isn't a Mercedes lower than the 300 series. Virtually all of them are top of the range 500s, 500 cell, the long version, a 500 say, the most powerful car Mercedes manufacture. Open top SLs in black, dark blue and bright red. Every single one of these cars would cost at least $100,000. Uday also has a fleet of Ferraris. There's several red Testaroses, an old Dino, four 348s. The cars gleam and sparkle. There isn't so much as a speck of dust on any of them. Everything here is as clinically clean as it would be on the intensive care ward in a hospital. The walls are tiled to the ceiling and the floor is specially covered. Parked behind the Ferraris is the Lamborghini Cantach series. These cars tear along roads like jet fighters about to take off from runways. Their top speed exceeds 200 miles per hour. Uday flies through Baghdad in these supercars, roaring down Palestine Street at 150 miles per hour. His luxury sport cars made Uday a talking point among his classmates every time he sped into the playground. Though I was never much impressed by his crazed desire to show off his wealth, I still found his behavior amusing and fascinating. Uday probably inherited his love of fast cars from Saddam who has an enormous fleet of his own. These are kept in his own garages. Uday probably picked up the habit of always driving himself from his father, too. He never trusts a chauffeur to drive him. He also insists his car tires stop with a squeal when he brakes to a halt. Driving a car, Munyamham said repeatedly as he was teaching me to drive like Uday, is something sacred, a ritual, something special. Always remember that. Next to the Lamborghinis are the silver-gray Maseratis. Buy turbos. Incredibly fast. Much faster than they appear. They're classic, elegant sports cars, not turbo-driven monsters. But the most impressive part of the fleet is Uday's collection of Porsches. I doubt the average Porsche dealership has as many as Uday. He has all the 911 series in all models and colors. He's got convertibles, Targus, turbos, the complete set. He's been equally as thorough in his purchase of Jaguars. He has four E-types, the cigar-shaped classics, a car reminiscent of a phallus. Two of these are open tops. The burgundy-colored pig's leather seats are as soft and smooth as a woman's inner thigh. The wheel spokes are all gilded. All the fittings are chrome, so finely polished you can see your reflection in them. When you start the engine, it sounds like a Scud missile taking off. A few yards away, are 28 12-cylinder versions, both the very latest models straight off the production line in British old-timers. It's an automotive treasure trove. A car fanatic's fantasy. All these luxury vehicles need constant cleaning and maintenance. Uday himself even regularly inspects the engines. His technical knowledge is zero but he loses his temper if a mechanic leaves so much as a greasy fingerprint on the chrome cylinder heads. After an accident, even a relatively minor dent, the car isn't repaired, it's scrapped. Uday road tests all his new purchases for speed and performance. Before each test drive, his bodyguards close off sections of the al qaedas motorway linking Baghdad and Kuwait. The test itself is a ludicrous performance. In order to be sure the new car is on a par with his current ones, he organizes car races. 24 hours before the race, Uday instructs the head of his workshop, Tamal al-Tikridi, to get the cars ready. 
new tires are put on the trial car. They're sticky Goodyear slicks, the type of tires used on Formula One racing cars. Any unnecessary ballast in the car, like the passenger seat and back seats, is stripped out. On the day of the test, Uday visits the garage and assigns his fellow racers other cars. The trial team roars down the closed motorway in a convoy the like of which you wouldn't see in Monaco. At the start point, two cars line up side by side. Uday is in the car to be tested, a Lamborghini Countach. He's securely belted into the bucket seat. Alongside him is a Ferrari Testarossa with a serious-faced bodyguard sat behind the wheel. Over the revving engines, a referee shouts a countdown. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Tires burn rubber and then the four-wheeled projectiles thunder off down the motorway. Who wins? Surprise, surprise, Uday does every single time. Woe betide anyone who comes close to beating a Rax master racing driver. No one must beat Uday at anything. The performance of the new car is of secondary importance, what's at issue is Uday demonstrates his driving skill and limitless courage to all those who get a fleeting glance of him. Every test is followed by endless debates about road holding, acceleration and other technical details. Loves losing himself in technical details despite the fact he doesn't really know what he's talking about. That still doesn't stop him enthusing about oversteering and understeering, aerodynamics and slip angle curves. Uday hasn't only got a fleet of cars, he's also got a fleet of helicopters. Four in total. They look striking as he has them repainted in novel colors by his painting crew. Uday hates military colors. He wants his helicopters to resemble those owned by Saudi and Kuwaiti princes. The interiors are like a luxurious drawing room. The exteriors must look like one of his sports cars. His favorite color is pale blue and he has tacky go faster stripes stuck on their bodywork. But the centerpiece of Uday's motorized collection, the absolute carnation of decadence, is an especially customized one-off that only exists in the garage of the Iraqi president's son. It's a 500 series Mercedes but fitted with a Rolls-Royce engine. An Italian manufacturer was flown to Baghdad to design and build this incredible motorized machine. It took the Italians and Uday's mechanics two months of hard work to get the luxury car with the fiendishly powerful engine to perform properly. The engine sounds like a rocket-propelled dragster used on world-record speed-breaking attempts on the Salt Lakes of Utah in the United States. Most of these cars are bought by Uday from European dealers and Darid just supervises their transportation to Baghdad. But Darid makes a small fortune with every new acquisition to Uday's fleet. Dereed gets away with it because money is unimportant to Uday and largely irrelevant in his life. None of his close colleagues is paid regular wages, myself included. At the end of my training, I raised the issue with Munyam Hamd. As I soldier, I'd been paid 22 dinars a month, a ludicrously low salary when you consider it's the equivalent of 25 US dollars. Munyam Hamd advised me, if you need money, go straight to Uday and he'll give you all you need. But so far I hadn't needed any and I didn't see how I ever would. Uday's staff cook and serve all my food and drink. Clothes are always provided for me and are freshly washed and ironed every day. Toiletries like toothpaste, aftershave, soap and shampoo are replaced automatically just like in a five-star hotel. Like an excited puppy dog, Uday rushes up to greet his car dealer. He puts his arm round him and even kisses him. Dereed grins devotedly back. After Dereed, at intervals of just a few minutes, Kamali Ajuid, said Kamune, Muandani, and Amar Asami. These men play just as important role in Uday's life as the car dealer as they're involved in acquiring women and girls for him. Ali Ajuid is actually employed by Uday to source fresh, young girls from schools and universities. Ones that Uday's own trawls outside the entrances have missed. Uday even married Ali Ajuid off to a girl he'd raped. Not surprisingly, he hasn't brought her with him to the party. Said Kamune is known as one of the biggest pimps in Baghdad. He's a vile character. He runs numerous bars and nightclubs which are all hotbeds of prostitution. He's known as the godfather of sex. 
officially said owns an import and export business but it's just a cover for his sleazy main business and his main import is girls. He imports them as if they are television sets from Asia. Beautiful, exotic Asian girls work in most of Baghdad's bars and afterwards work overtime in the customers' beds if the drinkers so desire. Said controls these women and Uday has a financial stake in this oldest and immoral trade in partnership with Said. No wonder Said is said to own half of Baghdad and the profits from hotels, bars and private gambling are immense. Muandani is another aspiring dealer in women. Accompanying these men comes a whole crowd of young ladies. They all wear tight suits, showing off their desirable figures to perfection. Some are in miniskirts which would be unthinkable in other Arab countries, especially in a palace. But Uday has no religious scruples. I don't think he would ever acknowledge the possibility that any being could be greater than himself. I once heard him say, what did Allah ever give me? Nothing. Does Allah give me a single dinar? No. Allah gives me nothing. So you stick with Uday, he has dinars and that makes him greater than Allah. Since 1987, I've only seen him pray once. That was when he visited the holy shrine of al tekiya al-Sufiya. As Uday's appearances always are, the event was photographed, filmed and broadcast on Iraqi television the next day. Mr. Uday Saddam, the great son of the president, has visited the holy place. Little do they know how little respect Uday has for religious beliefs. Back at Uday's party, Abdul Akhil has taken to the stage by the pool to polite applause. He's the one and only act. Uday never wants any other singers and Abdul Akhil is capable of singing for up to eight hours. His first song at this auspicious occasion, is a tribute to Uday's father and Uday's favorite song. Saddam, O oh Saddam, you great and powerful man. Most of the guests know this and listen with suitable expressions of respectful awe. As I watch Abdul's mouth carousing into the microphone I think he might as well be licking Saddam's backside. The lyrics are gushing and sycophantic. The song is a hypocritical in praising Saddam Hussein and is played everywhere all of the time. To his credit, Abdul's melodic voice manages to produce something vaguely pleasant to the ears out of the dull rhythm with its endless overstretched verses repeating over and over again how great and powerful Saddam is. All the guests wisely join in the choruses and Uday swings his brandy glass in time to the music. He's sitting next to the stage with three western women who I've never seen before. They've probably been flown in by said Kamiak as a birthday present to his business partner. Ude is already slightly drunk and is constantly sipping from his glass of brandy. When Abdul begins his next song, Ude gets to his feet and pulls a girl in a tight, dark blue silk suit up with him. She's wearing black patent shoes with high heels which make her taller than Ude. She's dyed her hair blonde and her face is heavily made up. Someone has obviously told her that's the way Ude likes it. Her lips are dark red and glossy and she has slightly bluish powder on her cheeks rather elegantly applied, not all over the place as some girls do who look a bit as if they've been in a fight. She has large breasts which bounce in time with her dancing as if they're trying to escape from her blouse. Her dress is low cut and presses her smooth, white breasts tightly together. Dancing is like fucking, observes a laughing Uday. Uday takes the blonde in his arms. She closes her eyes and yields to his rhythm. She writhes like a snake, her hips swaying round in a circle, her belly trembling and thrusting her pelvis erotically as if she could already feel Uday inside her. Uday honors her with two dances before abruptly leaving her where she is and choosing another girl who's also a fabulous dancer with great rhythm. That doesn't apply to Uday. He moves without elegance, grace or sense of timing. Rather than a jaguar slinking on the black marble by the pool, he's more like a bulldozer, barging into other dancers. No one minds because Uday is enjoying himself and that's the sole point of the gathering. Uday grabs his dance partner and kisses her, his body pressed against hers. He licks her face, his tongue is everywhere and it's obvious she doesn't like it. But she just giggles nervously and everyone watching laughs. Then she rubs herself along his leg, Writhing as she does so, Uday groans theatrically as if in ecstasy then shouts, I love your mouth. I love your hair. I love your nose. I have to have you. He grabs her by the hips, 
reaches for her firm buttocks pulls her against him and humps against her like a dog on heat. He roars with laughter and shouts, I don't know another arse like yours. The buffet is served. The guests are invited upstairs to the party room for dinner. The masters of ceremonies have worked their magic up here, too. Jacob al Masihi and Said al Masihi have conjured up a magnificent spread that's a match for any buffet in the Rashid Hotel. Jacob al Masihi is Uday's personal chef and food taster, while Said al Masihi always accompanies Uday on his foreign jaunts. On a table that must be at least 60 feet long, hundreds of dishes are laid out. Each one carefully prepared and presented. In the middle, is an Iraqi eagle carved out of butter. All around it are melons, peaches, nectarines, apples, oranges, grapefruits, strawberries, pineapples. Set amongst all these are more exotic fruits. I don't know what they're called, I've never seen them before. They've probably been flown in from Kuwait that very evening. On the left-hand side of the table stand the chefs, lined up like toy soldiers. In front of them flash shiny silver serving vessels with gold handles, engraved with Iraqi eagles. Whatever your palate, there's something on offer to whet your appetite. Speciality dishes are included from just about every continent, Arab, Asian, and European. Pink duck breast on red peppers, turkey breast roulade with chicken liver sauce and hair and a peppercorn jus catch my eye. The cooks proudly offer their culinary delights, politely asking whether they can create a menu or if the guests would rather choose for themselves. The cold buffet is equally as impressive and mouth-watering. There's a shoal of salmon on silver salvers, three different kinds of caviar in huge silver bowls. Transparent red salmon caviar. Silvery beluga carefully presented on crushed ice. Shelled lobster and opened oysters. Pale French foie gras. Parma ham. Carpaccio and pink roast beef with various sauces. Barbary duck with plums and kiwi fruit, sliced chicken breast and blinis with caviar. Salmon tartar, smoked trout mousse, asparagus salad with fresh herbs and shrimps. There's also just about every Arab dish. Between all these gastronomic treats are vegetables and carrots cleverly carved into the shape of roses. Lemons and radishes are cut into artistic spirals. As instructed, I keep discreetly in the background. I avoid getting into conversations and try not to catch anyone's eye. I walk quickly through the crowd fast enough so no one approaches me. I hang aimlessly about with my back to the wall. Every time a waiter approaches offering champagne, I take a glass but drink it slowly. I think it best to keep a clear head. Abdelakal sings his heart out without a break. He must have sung the hymn praising Saddam Hussein at least ten times. By now Udi is completely drunk, staggering around and probably seeing everything through an alcoholic haze. Girls are clinging to him, probably supporting him. If another man dares to ask a girl to dance, Ude sees it as an impertinence even though he can't dance with ten girls at the same time. All the men present know Ude too well to do this tonight so the birthday boy is often invisible in a melee of women. As I walk around the room, I recognize Ahmad Fadel. Ahmad is a lieutenant in Uday's troop of bodyguards. He's an extremely dangerous man. If someone annoys him, he whips out his pistol and shoots them. It doesn't matter if it's a man or woman. His pet hate is prostitutes. He treats them worse than animals, they are scum. Having a conversation with Ahmad is Hassan Sapti. He's a goldsmith and gold designer. No one seems to know if he has any real talent for his craft but Hassan is Uday's friend so people buy from him regardless. Hassan is standing next to a tall, slim woman. She's wearing a pink pullover embroidered with pearls and a matching pink silk skirt. Whoever she is, she has both beauty and style. After midnight, the party games begin. Uday is on the floor lying on top of one of the women. Amr Asami is standing over them encouraging Uday. Amr is the son of a pimp. But at first glance you wouldn't think he's the son of anyone because he's a transvestite. He has breasts like a woman, moves like a woman, dresses like a woman. He's immoral, loud, vulgar and his voice is as shrill as a tropical bird screech. Uday is fascinated by Amr because there's something animalistic about him or her. 
Amr's whole being shrieks for open, uncompromising sex. Uday loves having Amr beside him. He loves touching this strange sexual being. To Uday, Amr is indecency personified. He even pulled strings to get Amr excused from doing military service so he could still be Uday's constant companion. Amr isn't the only bird of paradise in Uday's life. Another member of Uday's intimate inner circle is Issam Mala who's also a transvestite. Issam Mala holds a special distinction. He's the only person to have insulted Uday and still be alive. It's common knowledge he has a relationship not only with Uday but also with Sabani, a young, fit, secret service officer but he doesn't want to give up Uday because the president's son is his life insurance. Tear the whore's clothes off. Shouts Uday. His friends take it as an order. They immediately begin groping and molesting all the women, most of whom are now drunk. The ones that aren't and weren't expecting such a turn of events are chased shrieking through the building. When caught, their clothes are ripped off and many are thrown into the swimming pool. Uday disappears into his room with two women, the same room I spent several months living in. He leaves the door wide open and doesn't pull the curtains. Everyone larking by the pool can watch as he ties the women up and beats them with his electric cable. From time to time, he glances at the huge television which is showing a pornographic video being played on the VCR. The sadistic images on the screen are of men having sex with leather-clad European women who pleasure their trainers and seem to enjoy being whipped and tortured. Uday enjoys these videotapes and has hundreds of them. While Uday is having fun on the black silk sheets in his room, his birthday party has turned into a wild orgy. The only people who aren't naked are the waiters in their white uniforms with starched collars. Uday's guests are even having sex in the toilets, standing up and watching themselves in the Baroque mirrors. Follow for the next chapter.